Rice Church once again. Uh, I'm so excited about today's message. We're going to continue our message or our topic on asking for a friend. And we started this series last week, and it's going to run all the way through August because we want to answer the questions that are burning in the culture's minds right now. And last week, we began with Christianity and faith. And what we said was, every person is a person of faith. No matter where you land on the spectrum, you landing somewhere. So we said, if you're going to be a follower of Jesus Christ, it begins by faith. Uh, Next week, we're going to talk about uh, race and the church. And um, tap on some topics as far as women within the church. Uh, Next week, uh, my friend... Dr. Jeff Orge is going to kind of uh, handle that next week. He's from, he's a president of Gateway Seminary. So again, if you have friends or family, we want to tackle that next week. We're going to talk through things like critical race theory and, and, and other things dealing with women within the body of Christ, okay? Uh, last week, we challenged you. We wanted you to text the word question at 909 909- 281-7797. And there you were able to give us questions throughout uh, the worship service and throughout the week, and we received over 100 questions. And we're not going to be able to answer 100 questions here today. We won't get out of here until about 2026. <laughs> However, we've given you a platform that we can answer those questions. So we're going to answer some here. But also, if you have not signed up for our newsletter, go to sunrisechurch.org, sign up for the newsletter, because it's there where we answered a lot of the questions. But also, on Wednesday night, uh, this past week, Pastor David Gunn and my wife, Deandra, did a 45-minute segment answering some of those questions. So those are going to be our platform. So go to sunrisechurch.org. You can go to our Facebook and also Instagram, and there you will find where we're answering those questions, okay? Uh, how are we going to do it? Again, it's by texting. Yes, take out your cell phone. Yes, it's okay. Remember, we want you to text question at 909-281-7797. So today's topic, we're going to deal with gender and sexuality. And, and, and we understand it's going to get a little tense in here. However, we want uh, to show love grace, kindness as we walk through this topic. Amen? Are you ready to get started? Are you ready to get started? Online, if you're ready to get started, say, I'm ready to get started. I want to introduce my pastor, my lead pastor, Steve. And um, as usual, you know, I'm always want to know why. Why do you feel we should talk about this topic now? Well, culture is already talking about it, and we're a part of culture. Uh, so I think we should be talking about it in the church as well. You know, the other piece of this is that as a pastor, I've, I've had the opportunity to interact with people on a variety of, of sexual issues, uh, in, including a lot of what we'll talk about today, uh, all over the, the sexual map. Um, in fact, I, re- I recall a couple of years ago, we were doing a, a, a youth camp, and um, there was a young lady who was coming part of the camp, and uh, her mom informed us that she was actually born as a boy, and so that sort of complicated the issue of, as to where she's going to stay. So the transgender issue is very much uh, something that we ran into even, you know, even in the church. On top of all of that, as I have family members who are gay and lesbian and dealing with gender issues. Um, I also have kids who are in public school and engaged in social media and are in this world. So this isn't some distant issue. This is very much personal to me, as I'm guessing is probably the case with most of the people who are in this room and watching online. You know, it's funny because it's close to me as well, and I have family members, friends, uh, that are actually practicing this as we speak. And what's interesting, at the 9 o'clock service, someone approached me and said, hey, pastor, you didn't know this, but my son is gay. And um, I've been on this individual for a lot of years, but yet he thought it to say it today. Mm -hmm. So we want to act like we're not in the room. Mm -hmm. And with that being said, sir, I would love to start our conversation. This is a question that was handed or came through social media 
The first question is, can someone who is LGBT also be a Christian? So let's define terms, LGBT, uh, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender. There's also some other parts of that, QIA+. Plus. Uh, and the term Christian, we're defining as somebody who has placed their faith in Jesus as, as their personal Lord and Savior. So I've had some time to think about this this week, and I have uh, some things that I'd like to prepare, and then we'll sit down and discuss it, okay? Absolutely. So before we jump into this, uh, I just want to say two things. Number one, uh, let's not talk about people as if they're not in the room. Uh, the reality is that I know for a fact that there are, are some who may be in the room watching online who are directly struggling with gender and sexuality, and countless others who are indirectly struggling. We've got brothers and sisters, uh, sons and daughters, parents, extended family members, and so let's have some compassion some sensitivity. The second thing that I want to affirm is that the church has had a pretty poor track record at, when it comes to ministering to uh, persons who are LGBT. And I, I think we probably all know somebody who is a, a professing Christian who would regularly uh, make gay jokes. Maybe you knew somebody who would talk in like an, in, in a feminine voice or use really crude terminology. Uh, I've even seen pastors do it from a stage. And when they tell the joke, everyone laughs, including the person who's secretly struggling. And the reason why they laugh is because they're trying to fit in because if they knew if their secret ever got out, they'd be the subject of the next joke. And meanwhile, they're carrying this burden alone. I remember years ago having a volunteer leader who did a rant about gays and lesbians on Facebook, and I just remember thinking, anybody who's in your small group who's struggling with that is never going to talk to you about it. Uh, and so it's uncomfortable to admit, but many of us in the church community have been rude and dismissive and have walked away from talking about tough issues instead of leaning into them. And for that, I say, I am sorry. We can do better. Let's start today. Okay? So to get to this question, um, can someone who is LGBT also be a Christian? Uh, the fast answer to this is absolutely yes. I mean, anyone who calls on the name of the Lord can, can be saved. I mean, the Apostle Paul says in uh, Ephesians uh, chapter 2, he says, for it is by, for Ephesians 3, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. That grace is an undeserved gift, meaning that Jesus gives it to us not because of anything we've done, simply because he loves us and wants to have a relationship with us. So regardless of whatever you've done or didn't do, our job is to receive that free gift by faith. So anyone at any time can also can be, can be a Christian. They can receive Christ in their life by faith. But I think that's probably not what this question is asking. My guess is there's a question behind the question. And my guess is the question is, can I have Jesus in my life and also be sexually active in a variety of uh, sexual expressions. And so I think that the answer to this question boils down to this. What do you believe about the Bible? Now, there are some of you who believe that the Bible is God's word, that it has no error, and it's the best guide for how we should live our lives. But there are some of you who don't believe that at all. I could say, because the Bible said so, and your response would be, okay, well, I don't believe the Bible. <laughs> so there's probably nothing I'm going to say today that would change the way that you, you think or behave. But I think there's a whole lot of us who are sort of like somewhere in between. Uh, maybe you're a, a modern Christian, so to speak, where you're, you're religiously engaged, but you're just not as dogmatic on certain issues as maybe your parents are or your, or your grandparents are. And maybe it's possible we just aren't fully aware of what the Bible says because it says a lot about gender and sexuality. So this is what I'd like to do this morning. I'm just going to identify five different things that the culture teaches about gender and sexuality and what the scripture teaches about gender and sexuality. And we'll just simply present them to you side by side, and then you can decide what you want to do to respond to that information. Okay? So let's start first on the cultural side. Uh, here's the first one. Number one, the cultural understanding of gender is that gender is fluid. So what exactly do we mean by that? Well, here's how the Harvard Medical Review defined gender fluidity. As people whose gender identity doesn't match the sex assigned to them on their original birth certificate, meaning that at times you may identify as a boy, at times you may identify as a girl, at times identify as both, 
or at times identify as neither. It is fluid. An example of this would be pop star Demi Lovato. Uh, back in May of 2021, Demi Lovato uh, said this, in this quote, she said, I identify as non-binary. With that said, I'll be officially changing my pronouns to they, them. I feel that this best represents the fluidity I feel in my gender expression and allows me to feel most authentic and true to the person I both know I am and am still discovering. Well, Demi Lovato made headlines again just uh, a week ago because she uh, once again changed her pronouns. And this was uh, her quote again. She said, I've been feeling more feminine, and so I've adopted she, her again. So this is an example of gender fluidity. At times, uh, you may be feeling this way, and at times, you may be feeling this way. But if your feeling changes, then, then you need to respond to that. So culture would teach on this particular issue that gender is fluid. Scripture teaches a very different message. Scripture teaches that gender is fixed. So in the very first book of the Bible, in the very first chapter, it took God 27 verses to get to the issue of gender. And this is what it says in Genesis 1:27. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. The message of the Christian Bible is that God created two genders, male and female. But to be fair, this happened before sin entered the world, which begs the question of does this still hold up? According to Jesus in the New Testament, the answer is yes. He affirmed this in a conversation he had with some religious leaders in Matthew chapter 19, when he said this in verse 4. Haven't you read, he replied, that at the beginning the Creator made them male and female? So Jesus himself held to a strict binary understanding of gender and sexuality, that God created male and female. So different message there. Let's go to the second one. If, if uh, culture teaches on this particular thing that sexuality has a spectrum, meaning that all of us are born somewhere on a spectrum and that may change uh, how, how you identify. So sexuality uh, is, is a topic that can be difficult to define. And so just this past week, I was reading this article from a licensed clinical social worker who um, posted this blog to a medical website called Healthline. And here's how she described it. Sexuality is how and if you experience sexual and romantic attraction. And so, again, the idea is that some people may experience these in a lot of different ways. It wasn't that long ago that there was really two categories in this conversation, gay or straight. Well, the title of this article was 47 Terms That Describe Sexual Attraction Behavior and Orientation. Heterosexuality is one of those 47. The, the pervasive belief on this is that sexuality has a spectrum, and you're going to be born somewhere along there, and you could move along that spectrum. That's the cultural understanding. Again, scriptural is very different. If culture teaches that sexuality has a spectrum, scripture teaches that sexuality has a standard. Again, the first book of the Bible, Genesis chapter 2, it says this. It says that in, in Genesis 2, then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. The man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. This is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. This is the invention of marriage. One man, one woman, one flesh. That phrase, one flesh, refers not just to the physical union of sexual intercourse, but also to the lifetime commitment of unity. But again, this happened before sin entered the world, and so the question has to be asked of, does something like this still hold up today? And again, Jesus affirmed that as yes. In the same conversation that we read earlier in Matthew 19, Jesus said this. He said, haven't you read that at the beginning the Creator made them male and female, and said, for this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh? So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. So Jesus also affirmed that marriage between one man and one woman is the standard, and it's God who brings that together in, in, in what we would understand as biblical marriage. Now, there's a book in the Bible called Hebrews, which is like a, um, a combining of Old Testament and New Testament. 
And here's what the book of Hebrews has to say in Hebrews 13, 4. It says, marriage should be honored by all and the marriage bed kept pure, for God will judge the adulterer and the sexually immoral. So the Old Testament, the New Testament, and then the book that combines the two all hold to a pretty strict standard that God created sexuality to be enjoyed within the boundaries of a relationship between a fixed gender man and a fixed gender woman who are committed together in marriage. And according to the Christian Bible, anything outside of that is considered to be immoral by God. And so this would include, but is certainly not limited to, the single heterosexual man who's sleeping with his girlfriend, the single homosexual girl who's uh, sexually engaged. It could be the person who is dabbling in pornography. It could be the engaged couple who's sleeping together, the couples who are living together, or a legally married homosexual couple. According to the scriptures, that would be outside of God's standard of acceptable sexual behavior. And so if this is you, the way in which you would step back into a honoring God's design would be to abstain from sexual activity until or unless you are married uh, in, a, in a relationship with one man and one woman. That's the scriptural understanding. Let's go through three more briefly, and then I'll let you breathe again. Uh, number three, culture uh, teaches this. Love yourself. That you can't love another person until you first love yourself. You have to be enough. Again, Scripture has a very different understanding. Scripture doesn't teach love yourself. Scripture teaches die to self. Jesus literally taught, if anyone wants to be my disciple, it's not that he has to love himself. He has to actually deny himself and pick up his cross, the symbol of death, and follow me. Jesus actually taught dying to yourself is the way forward to healthy relationships. Again, back to culture. Uh, the cultural understanding is that you have to be true to your heart. You have feelings and desires, and you need to be uh, submissive to those. Pay attention to those. Those are indications of your true self. And to live your most authentic life, you need to not suppress such feelings or desires, but respond to them. This is what Demi Lovato did. Again, Scripture teaches a very different message. It doesn't teach be true to your heart. It teaches beware of your heart. Jesus actually taught that the evil desires come out of the heart. The Old Testament prophet Jeremiah taught that the heart is deceitfully wicked. Who can know it? It's a very different message. And here's one more. Culture teaches love is love. We shouldn't overcomplicate it. We shouldn't put it in a box that anyone can love anyone for any reason. And so let's just celebrate love for what it is. Again, Scripture teaches a different message. Not that love is love, but that God is love. That God doesn't just show love, but is actually the standard, the measuring stick of what love is through justice, mercy, and grace. Justice, not allowing sin to go unpunished, so he punishes his own son. Mercy, by not giving us what we deserve. And grace, by, but by giving us what we don't deserve. That Jesus is the, is the absolute essence of what love is. Love is not defined by love, but defined by God. And so, as you see these two lists side by side, gender is fluid, gender is fixed. Sexuality has a spectrum, sexuality has a standard. Uh, the, the, the third one is um, that, that we are to love uh, ourselves or die to selves. Uh, the fourth one, be true to your heart, beware of your heart. Fifth one, love is love, God is love. When you look at those two lists side by side, one thing should be apparent to you. These are very different messages that are diametrically opposed. You simply can't have both at the same time. And so it's up to us to decide how we want to respond to that. So there's a fascinating story that's buried deep in the Old Testament book of 2 Kings chapter 22. It's about this king named Josiah who decides that he wants to repair the temple. The temple was the, the epicenter of Jewish religious life and had been neglected over the years by priests not doing their job. And so he hires this cleanup crew to get the work underway. And in the process, they find a book of the law, which would have been the Bible that was available to them at that time. And so they, they bring it over to the king like, hey, look what we found. And the fact that they found the book of the law meant they weren't reading the book of the law, <laughs> which meant they weren't obeying the book of the law. You know, so they blow the dust off of it, and, and the king says, hey, well, why don't you read it to me? And so look how the king responded when they read the Bible that was available to him. It said in verse 11 of 2 Kings 22, 
When the king heard the words of the book of the law, he tore his robes. Tearing of garments was a symbol of repentance, a symbol of saying, I've done this wrong, but now I want to do this right. And when the king realized what the Bible said, he decided in front of the entire kingdom that he was going to align his life to those words. And it's possible that many of us just simply didn't know what the Bible had to say. But now you do. And so it's up to us to decide how we're going to respond. Pastor Anthony. Amen. You know, as you were talking, Pastor Steve, we're now just laying the foundation on um, what it looks like to be, uh, as we view gender and sexuality. Remember, if you have a question, I will be getting those on my iPad up here. Uh, Just text question to 909-281-7797. And the first question that we got in is uh, actually the second question, I'm sorry. Does a person's identity and how they identify really affect their relationship with the Lord? Yeah, uh, 100% emphatic yes. Identity is everything. It's it's what gives our lives meaning. It's how we see the world. It's how we live and love in the world. Uh, identity is everything. And so uh, f- for, for the longest time, uh, identity was often found by, by looking to others. Somebody else has to validate me. So to illustrate this, let's look at some Disney princesses. Okay? Let's take uh, Ariel from um, The Little Mermaid, right? So she's, she's swimming around under the sea and saying, I want to be part of their world. You know, and so w- I need to change who I am so that I could be a part of their world, right? So I need to look to the outside for someone to validate me. Well, the the pendulum has swung almost all the way to the other side of that, and I don't know if it's just a reaction to this, to now I have to validate me. I don't don't wait for somebody else to do it. I validate me. So an example of this would be Elsa from the movie Frozen, right? In In the big signature song, Let It Go. You know, it's this, it's this the, the lyrics of the song are, uh, you know, don't let them in, don't let them see, be the good girl uh, I, I need to be, uh, conceal, don't feel, don't let them know, you know, well, now they know, you know, and then let it go. And it's interesting because she's by herself and she undergoes this, this coming out, so to speak, right there before our eyes. You know, she's wearing this drab outfit and her hair is kind of up in a bun and then the hair comes unfurled you know and her outfit transforms into this big long flowing blue gown and she's essentially saying enough of everybody telling me what to do i choose who i'm going to be and it's a very different message from from even what we saw just a couple years ago well christianity offers a third option and that's identity found in christ not being validated by another person not me validating me but actually Jesus validating me. The verse we read earlier, it is a gift from God. He validates us. It's received, not achieved. And when when you look at the scriptures about identity, 2 Corinthians 5.17, anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The old is gone, the new is here. Not, Not like a marginally improved version of yourself, a new creation. It doesn't mean you don't struggle with sin, but it means that you have now the power to step into this new identity for the rest of your life. And when you have this identity in Christ, it completely changes the way that you see the world. And all other markers of my identity now get demoted. So let's illustrate it like this. Uh, you and I were recently in Kenya. And we, uh, the, the main guy who was leading us was a guy named Augustine, who, who we called Gus. So it, explain to people, describe Gus for, for those who don't know him. How would you describe him? Gus was very, um, first of all, he was funny. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, He walked with um, this type of authority. He was kind. He was very relational. Um, But he meant business. And when we went to various, whether it was in the churches or out the neighborhoods, you can definitely see that he was a follower of Jesus. Yeah, and you and I would often just kind of talk just between the two of us, you know, how much we looked up to this guy, right? So because my identity is in Christ, I could look at Gus, this man on the other side of the world, as my brother, as somebody I want to serve with, serve under, submit to, befriend. My identity in Christ completely changes the way that I live and love. 
But see, for many people, the primary marker of their identity is their sexuality. You know, I'm, I'm gay, I'm straight, I'm, I'm, I'm bi, I'm transgender, whatever. And that becomes the way in which you see the world. But let's just take sexuality off the map for a second. And let's talk about two other factors that people tend to mark their identity by. Ethnicity. I'm black, I'm white, I'm Asian. The other one is nationality. You know, I'm American, I'm Mexican, I'm African. All right. And so in, in our case with Gus, let's just say that my identity was rooted in my ethnicity. So I could look at a person like Gus and say, hey, great guy, sharp guy, loves the Lord. It's too bad he's not white. You know, that, that would have really, because that's the, the primary marker of my identity. It changed the way that I see. Or nationality. Yeah, Gus, great guy, but, you know, he's African. I mean, Africa's nice and all, but it's not America. We all know America's the best, you know, chance of USA breakout across the crowd, right? That's, my, that's, that's where I'm, I'm my highest marker of my identity. But when my identity is found in Christ, it demotes all other markers of my identity to much further down the list to where I'm called to love and serve and be committed to a truth standard, and it changes the way that I serve people, the way that I love people, and the way that I live my life. Identity is everything. It absolutely affects a person's relationship with the Lord. Mm. Amen. And, and I like where you're going with that, Pastor Steve, because sometimes we get hooked up with this identity issue. You know, so once you're in Christ, you are a new creation, and that's now the person you have become. And Christ expects you to move in that. So uh, you should say things like, I'm a Christian who happens to be black. Mm -hmm. I'm a Christian who happens to be a nurse. I'm a Christian who happens to be a school teacher. Because you're, you totally have changed who you are. And now that's more the well top said. what you would say, huh? Well said. Well said. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Yeah. So, again, we want you to dialogue with this conversation. So, again, text question at 909-281-7797. And this question just came in. Okay. My child just told me they like the same sex. What should I do? <laughs> okay, that one just came in. Uh, okay, well, let's solve the complexity of the problems in five minutes, right? Uh, look, we, we're, this is incredibly hard and uh, incredibly sensitive. I, I think child, we don't know the age there. Um, that, that, could, that could potentially change this, but this is what I would say. Uh, first of all, whether it's your child or somebody else, if you're a follower of Jesus, the command is to treat others the way that you want to be treated. Uh, and so that, that's our starting point. Um, and so I, I think that for... For parents who, who are raising kids, here's the best we can do. We can point them to Christ. We can model it at home. It's got to start with me. We, got, we can model it at home. And then we pray our socks off. Outside of that, I'm not sure there's a whole lot I could do because I can't change a person's heart. So my child uh, could grow up, pastor's kid, and never follow Christ. Um, I can't, he, my child has to have an encounter with Jesus himself. I can't do that for him. And I, if I'm being honest, Pastor Anthony, I think that there's a lot of Christian parents who would, who would rather their kid be straight than be saved. I think there's probably a lot of Christian parents who would rather their kid identify with how they were born than being, identify with being born again. And so I, I think we need to start with just presenting Christ and then praying that they have an encounter with Jesus. Uh, you know, one of the verses we talked about last week was Hebrews eleven six, 6, which says that God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek after him. Well, does that promise happen overnight? That God rewards me overnight if I go looking for him? That could take weeks, months, decades. Uh, how... how are we patient enough to wait on the Lord, or do we just want God to microwave all of our problems? You know, type it in, God, God, God do it. And so the reality is that for, for, the, for the child, for me, for you, God's not done with me. 
He's still working on me. We just sang a song about refining. He's refining us all. But, but the truth is we have to have an encounter with Jesus and then believe that when you do, the Spirit of God comes into your life and begins to conform you into the person, the man or woman that God wants you to be. And that just takes time. And so I think we have to pray and wait on the Lord and not give up on the fact that we really believe that Jesus can, can transform a person. Again, it doesn't mean you, don't, you, you stop struggling with every sin, but it means that over time you look a little bit more like Jesus every day. Amen. And I think I would add to what Pastor Steve is saying. It's all about your response as a parent. Mm. Um, James said, be quick to listen and slow to speak. Mm. There's a reason why God gave us two ears and one mouth. Mm. Um, I think he wants us to listen more. So the question now becomes, as the child, which we don't know the age, mm -hmm. as they are expressing this, you need to be listening for those key words, and you really want to get under the veil or behind the curtain. So you don't want to go so dogmatic and just yell and scream. You want to kind of ask questions, and through those questions, through the Holy Spirit, asking God to help you, but... You don't want to shut the door right away because, right, right you shut right. the door, then, That's it. then there's no conversation. Yeah, and, and if, you, if you're following the Bible, if you're trying to align your life to the Bible, Paul says that let your, let your conversation be gracious, seasoned with salt. We're commanded by the Apostle John to speak the truth in love. Jesus himself was called the embodiment of grace and truth. So it doesn't mean that you have to compromise your faith and just say, okay, I just endorse everything. I just give you the, the pat on the back, go live your life, go be your most authentic self. No, it says, listen, I, I, I don't agree, but I want you to know I love you. You're my child, and I'm sticking with you. And I think that that's a hard thing to do as a parent, but the reality is that it doesn't have to be a, a, a same-sex issue. It could be anything, and uh, we, we need to be praying for our kids for sure. Amen. Here's another one. My kids watch shows with same-sex storylines. When is it a good time to educate kids on sexuality? <laughs> Yesterday. Uh, yeah, you know, um, so this past week on Disney+, Plus, uh, the movie Lightyear came out, and this is a, a, a Disney animated movie. It, it kind of made headlines before it even hit the theaters that there's a, um, a main character who's married to a woman and there's a, a lesbian kiss uh, in, this, in this particular movie. And so my kids were asking me, hey, can we watch this? And so for me, it was a sit down conversation. I said, okay, before we do, let me just tell you what you're gonna see. And we talked about God's design for marriage. Now, here's the thing. So many of us, we just want the screens to raise our kids. And we've got to be willing to put our phones down and engage in the content that our kids are engaging with. I can't expect Disney to raise my children. Uh, and so I, I think it's important to, especially if your kids are young, to, be, to get into the habit of talking about tough issues while they're young. Because then when these things come up, it won't feel awkward. Why, why is mom talking about this stuff? Oh, why is dad bringing this stuff up? You know? Because we've already established this rhythm in our family that we talk about anything. I was sharing during the 9 o'clock hour that a couple of years ago, my son came in the house and he asked my wife and I about this, like, really specific sex act. We're like, oh, my goodness, where did you hear this? In my mind, I'm about to explode. But, in, you know, on my outward, I'm like, oh, hmm, you know, interesting, very good. You know, and so I'm like, okay, where did this kid hear this? You know, what secular institution is jamming this stuff into it? You know where it happened? On my porch with the neighbor's kid, okay? Not some dark alley. This was at my house. We cannot expect our kids to be separate from the world. We have to be engaging with them now. Sometimes it's pausing the movie and having a little conversation. Uh, and then s sometimes it's bringing the stuff up uh, in car rides or at, at, during meal times. But it's on parents to introduce these things um, I was sharing last hour, too, there's a statistic about children when it comes to pornography, which we have affirmed is outside of God's standard of sexuality. The average age for children to be exposed to pornography is eight. Mm. And so if you're waiting until after eight to have the conversation with the birds and the bees, statistically speaking, 
you're the last one to the party. And so I think it's important to begin having conversations. I remember talking to my youngest, uh, to, to my child about sex when they were very young. And for me inside, it was like so awkward. And, you know, it's because I have all this shame from my whole life. But for a little kid, they, they, don't, they don't have any of that stuff yet. For them, it's just like a lesson, you know? Uh, so I think the earlier, the better. I don't, I don't think that you should wait because somebody's going to teach them. Uh, I'd rather it be the parents. Amen. And, and to put scripture to that, amen. Go ahead and clap for that. Uh, and the book of Proverbs says, train up a child in the way he or she should go. And when they grow older, they won't depart from it. Now, that doesn't mean they won't sway or drift. Right. However, they should remember how they were taught growing up. And it's funny how you talked about pornography, eight years old. I'm going to date my age right now, but it was a time when I was growing up. We used to go to uh, Blockbusters. Amen. That's where you go get rent movies. And there, y y you couldn't go behind the drape because behind the drape was all of the adult films and all the pornography and all of that. It seems now coaches just remove the drape, mm -hmm. remove the curtain, and now it's on the phone and they can yeah. get it free. Yeah. So you better believe if they have a cell phone or it's on TV, it's in cartoons, it's in commercials. So it's very imperative that the parents, uh, that you have this conversation, because if you don't, they're gonna learn it somewhere. Mm -hmm. And it's better that they learn it from you in the word of God. Yeah, you know, my, my, eight, my eight year old, uh, it would be extremely irresponsible as a parent for me to hand him the keys to the car and say, drive yourself to school. There's an understanding that it's going to take time and development to go through something as serious as that. And yet, how many of us just hand kids smartphones that have no filters on them and just expect them to make wise choices? It ain't going to happen. We've got to step in as parents. Amen. I want to, this, let's try to answer this last one. Okay. It's can I be in the wedding of a same-sex couple? Yeah. We talked about this this past week as our, as our pastors. How would you describe the, the room of pastors even on this issue? All over the place. Yeah. I, I don't think there's a hard and fast answer to this question. I do think this is a matter of conscience. Mm -hmm. So here's a couple of perspectives of people who have wrestled through this. Uh, one perspective says, okay, if I disagree with this, then I'm not going to go because my presence at the wedding would seem like an endorsement. But I'll go to the reception maybe. And then others would say, well, I wouldn't go to the reception because that's like the party. Isn't that also, you know, partying around this kind of thing? And so that's one side of it. The other side of it is, well, if they already know where I stand, how is me not coming to the wedding uh, going to change anything? Um, you know, I bet there's a lot of Christian, Christians who have gone to weddings and where a Christian was married to a non-Christian. Scripture forbids unequal yoking, the Christian marrying a non-Christian. But I bet we've done a plenty of those and even gave a nice little wedding gift in the process. So I do think it is a matter of conscience of wh where is my relationship with this person? Um, for some people, not going to this would end the relationship, and it would end an opportunity to ever live out the gospel. For others, they may say, listen, you know I love you. I'm not going to be there, but I'm going to be involved in your life. I really believe this is a matter of conscience. And, and I totally agree. Um, the Bible declares in Philippians that we need to work out our own salvation through fear and trembling. So what you must do as a Christian, you must decide, is this within my space or is it a no? Yeah. Another example would be alcoholism. Some say that drinking is a no-no, but that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says, be not drunk with wine. So now the question that becomes is, how does that play out in my life? Because mm -hmm. Paul says, do not use your freedom to cause another person to stumble so it's not that i can't drink it just says not to be drunk but now the question is how do i want people to see me so as a pastor for example my conviction is i do not drink because what does it look like having a pastor come out of the club or out of the bar i just lost my testimony on someone who may be struggling with alcohol so I use my freedom not to do it, but that's my conviction. Yeah. You know, and another, another piece of this conversation, too, is, you know, we talked about the, the scriptural um, standard of sexuality. Here it is. So one of the other questions that kind of comes up to this is how far can I get to the line without going over, right? Uh, 
Talk about it. And unfortunately, the only way that you know is by going over the line. You know, it's kind of like uh, going to the edge of a cliff and saying, how far can I get on the edge of the cliff before I fall? Well, you fall, and then you say, that last step, that was the one. Uh, and so I think that we, we, this, is, this, this falls in, you know, how far do I get to the line? I think that every person is going to have to determine how do I honor God's design for marriage uh, in a way in which I'm, tr- I'm, I'm personally responding to the standard, but how I interact with others who are not, that I believe there, there is uh, an area where you just have to pray and, and, and wrestle with, with your conscience and how the Spirit's leading you in that. I'm, I'm not sure there's a hard and fast answer to that. And, and I, wow, it's, it's amazing because, as you said earlier in the Scripture, we are called to die to self. Mm-hmm. And our responsibility is to be more like Christ. And the more, as Pastor Steve said last week, the more you get in front of your word, the more you allow uh, his word to refine you. I like that word. Mm-hmm. It, then it comes a point where you have to begin to start picking and choosing. And uh, as we wrap this up, please, again, we're going to be checking for questions all throughout the week. So, again, text us at 909-281-7797 or... You can go to sunrisechurch.org and put your question there, and we will receive it. But I want to wrap it up because we want to show you how a person lived this out in their life. Mm -hmm. Uh, So we have this video we want you to see, and I want you to pay close attention to Joseph's testimony. And I wonder if if it resonates with your heart, and then also if it challenges you to take a next step in Christ. Let's check out this video. My name is Joseph, and I was a Satanist. I used to come to Sunrise Church when I was around 17, 18 years old. I ended up leaving because I went astray. That's when I was with like Satanism, and when I was doing whatever I wanted, anything un- under the sun. I dabbled a lot in sexual immorality. I did a lot of drugs, alcohol, basking in my flesh type of thing, when deep down, I was suffering while I was worshiping the devil. I felt lost, confused, disconnected from myself, um, just death. I honestly used to be full of anxiety. I used to be full of depression or sadness. I would always be angry. No matter how many things I could try to do for myself and push myself through, I always kept feeling like I would slip back into this hole. And I would have this like hole inside of me that I needed to fill, but I just never knew how to do it. And I despised Christians. Oh, I hated them more than anything. I hated them, but I wanted what they had. They had peace. They had joy from what it seemed like to me. I guess I was jealous about that. I knew deep down, even though I didn't want to admit it, that I needed peace somehow. The moment in my life that I started seeing I needed a change was kind of when I got into trouble with law. And I just said I couldn't do this anymore. I needed a deeper purpose in my life. I got sober. I didn't really drink. I didn't really do drugs. So I wanted to know what I was going through, why I was feeling these certain things. And, you know, I started dabbling in reading the Bible. I started off with opening the book and truly giving myself to Christ. So I got baptized. I, I legit remember getting in that bathroom and praying about it and saying, and, and I heard God tell me, you know, by you doing this, you really do have to turn away from your old self. And ever since, I felt a complete difference in my life. I started doing Rooted. I got hooked up into the church, started actually donating my time to volunteering, to feeding people, and even on my spare time away from the church, I would uh, read, pray, you know, go deep into scripture, which is like honestly my favorite thing to do now. Like I actually feel like I survived against the devil because Christ saved my life. I feel peace, finally, joy. I know who I am. I finally can find myself through Christ. Jesus is my rock, my savior, and the one that gives you peace throughout your life. I do not believe that God is done with me yet. I still believe he's refining me. 
and now I feel like I have my life to look forward to. I wonder if that testimony resonate with you. I find it interesting because the first question was, can a person who is an LGBT practice or become or be a Christian? It's funny as society how we like to label people. But I want to read one scripture to you, and I wonder if you fall into any of these categories. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9 says this, or do you not know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral or idolaters nor adulterers nor men who lay with other men nor thieves nor the greedy nor the drunkards nor the slunders nor the swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. This is key. And that is what you were, which some of you were but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Everyone falls into one of those categories. If you went to Thanksgiving and you ate too much, that means you're greedy. Everyone doesn't listen to their parents because when you became two, you learned the word no. So at the end of the day, it's not about list, it's about your relationship with Jesus Christ. And yes, we're talking about gender and we're talking about sexuality, but what is your relationship with Jesus? Can you honestly say that you have accepted him as your Lord and Savior? And if the answer is no, that means it's never going to get right, which means you're both feet out. You don't want to hear it. You're tired of listening to it. But the question is, how's your life going right now? Or maybe someone that has one foot in and one foot out. You can't do both. If that's you, this is for you this morning. I believe Jesus uh, set you up for success. I know he did because he gave his life, but you're in this room today. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, or you pay, basically you probably turned away and said, I'm done with all of it. I want to appeal to you to, how about you do it again? So I want to take you through this little prayer, and you can do it at the quiet of your heart, uh, silence of your heart. If we can all bow our heads and close our eyes. If you're in here, and you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, you're not fooling anyone but yourself, I want to talk to you. If you once walked with Jesus and life happened and the struggle took you, I pray that you turn back towards if I just described you, I want you to say this prayer with me silently. Simply say, Lord, I'm broken. Help me. I admit that I'm a sinner, which means I admit that I got it wrong. But I believe that you sent your son, Jesus Christ, just for me. And today, I'm going to make a commitment to give my life to Jesus. Come into my heart, Jesus. In your name I pray, amen. If you pray that prayer, I want to be the first to say congratulations. I want to be the first to say welcome to the family. What about for the rest of us? How are you doing? Has a struggle took over you or, or have you say, I'm still moving forward? If that's you, I want you to remember to stay strong. Paul says, when I'm weak, his grace makes me strong. So stay committed, stay engaged, love Jesus, and he will see you through. Amen?